great to see you. Hello, I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. So, well, over this past week, we've seen pictures of the terrible devastation visited on Gaza by Israel's bombers. And the tanks rolled in last night. But Israel believes it is encircled by enemies. And there's no doubt many of those enemies would like to wipe Israel off the map. Is Israel justified in bombing Gaza? That's our first big question. Uh, later, we'll be asking, is it right to experiment on animals? Here in Oxford, that's a very big question indeed, as a new biomedical research lab takes delivery of its first consignment of monkeys. And do you know what your partner's up to, all those hours spent on the computer? Well, we'll be asking, can you commit adultery online? Uh, we're in Oxford at Witchwood Girls' School with a local audience, and up in the gods, we have the Mail on Sunday columnist Peter Hitchens, Rabbi Yitzhak Shockett from Mill Hill Synagogue, television presenter and reality TV star Esther Anson, and The Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. Well, this week 463 people have been killed by Israel's bombing of Gaza, more than 100 of those civilians, including at least 75 children. The bombs were in retaliation for the hundreds of rocket attacks launched by Hamas into Israeli towns and villages over the preceding weeks, which killed four Israelis. In fact, Hamas, uh, their constitution says, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it. So we ask, is Israel justified in bombing Gaza? Rabbi Shokit, you're just back from... Israel, aren't you? Indeed, yeah. How can this be justified? How is it anything but hugely disproportionate? Well, I mean, 75, upwards of 75 children killed. How does that weigh on your conscience? Let me say my heart certainly goes out to the Palestinian people. I think it's a tragedy of the highest order, and I think I would call upon all Palestinian people to stand up once and for all against the catastrophe of a Hamas terrorist so-called government that is using them as human shields. At the end of the day, and the bottom line is that whereas Israel looks to practice as much restraint as possible, where Israel certainly looks to avoid civilian casualty as much as possible, the flip side is that Hamas looks to deliberately target as many civilians as possible. We've practiced restraint now for the better part of three, four years. 6,000 rockets having landed upon Israel, it begs the question, are we just supposed to sit back and take it on the chin? How many Israelis have been killed in this? It's not about years? a numbers game. It's not a question of how many, because if they had it their way, if every one of those missiles had gone off and they had killed two, three million Israelis in the process, that's precisely what they'd be looking to achieve. Well, Middle Maybe East it was good fortune that those rockets didn't go off, and we're not looking to target any sort of civilians in response. Uh, Middle East historian Tash Hage, I mean, uh, Obama, Barack Obama said this, he said, if someone was sending rockets into my house, uh, where my two daughters sleep at night, I'm going to do everything in my power to stop that, and I would expect Israelis to do the same thing. I mean, that's quite true, but the point is we need to understand how the situation has come about. We, we seem obsessed with the current situation. We need to understand how Israel came into being. You know, we can debate here from now until doomsday about what's happened today, but we need to understand what has created the situation. Do, how many of us know about the uh, 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 Hussein McMahon correspondence? How many of us know about the Sykes-Picot agreement? How many of us know about the Balfour Declaration? We all, are all of them are duplicitous, are duplicitous agreements that brought about the state of Israel. But we are where we are. Yeah, and, 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 to, and to call Hamas a terrorist organization, what is the, uh, the, the Stalag, the Irgung and the Haganah. How many of us know this? You see, we only know one side of the narrative. It's easy for people to say that Hamas is a terrorist organization, yet they were democratically elected. I might not like them. In fact, I don't agree with Hamas a lot of the time. But I cannot say this is terrorist. How come one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter? Andrew Money? Well, it's not the case that they're freedom fighters. The first thing that Hamas did when they were allegedly elected was to kill their co-religionists in the Gaza. 
was to throw people off buildings, to shoot people in the back when they're running away. This is what the Hamas do to their own uh, co-religionists in the Gaza, to other Palestinians. So the first thing is that Hamas not only inflict terror on the people of Israel, they also inflict it on other Palestinians. It's for the Palestinian peoples, as the rabbi said, to try to overthrow this terrorist organization. An organization which... An organization which... You label which it as terrorist. Finish, it as terrorist. Uh, well, an organization which no, fulfills come every... On, come on, well, I don't know what else you call an what, organization what, 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 which has killed hundreds of... It. What was the Irgun? I, what I, was the Haganah? Well, the Ergun and the Haganah are not operating at the moment. No, but what were they? But, well, they were terrorist organizations Thank at the you. time. But I would say that it just we're talking about what's happening at the present. And the present situation is that Israel builds bunkers in which its civilians have to shelter from rocket fire from the Hamas. The Hamas builds bunkers and hides its rockets in it and then puts civilians on top of those bunkers. That is a terrorist what organization. Do you that is an organization that has no respect. What do you expect in a David and Goliath struggle? That is, a, that is a, an organization that has no respect for human lives, not Palestinian lives and not Israeli so, lives. F-16s, so, you're a, you know people in the Gaza, and also you're from, you're from the West Bank. Can you, and it's all about putting on a completely different pair of spectacles to try and understand the other side's position, because that's the only way we're ever going to get anywhere. Can you understand the Israeli position? I don't understand the Israeli position, because uh, they are causing so much carnage and bloodshed at the moment that is completely disproportionate for what they are claiming to achieve. Okay, Rabbi, Rabbi Shocket, could you... And Peter, I'll bring you in in a second. Could you, as, as calmly as you can, explain to Mahmoud again your position? I would only ask you, because I've heard this bantered about for so long, what constitutes a proportionate response? In other words, if they spend the last three years throwing 6,000 rockets into Israel, would you consider a proportionate response for Israel dropping 6,000 missiles back into Gaza and however many may be killed in the process, then so be it. I wonder what the UN would have to say to that. Well, Rabbi Shochat is, is actually vocaling uh, so many myths and so many um, misinformation about what's really happening on the ground. You know, Hamas was uh, agree agreed to a ceasefire for the last six months before this, the outbreak of the uh, recent, uh, recent violence. And no rockets were fired at Israel. Israel has recently engineered a situation in which it forced Hamas to shoot rockets at Israel. And you're talking and it, to me about Israel, myths? And Israel have, have done, in, uh, in the uh, last Robert, six months, Hamas, Robert, in the last six months, can I continue? Well, these, these guys are d just disturbed by something you just said, and it behoves me to actually uh, ask why. First of all, rockets continue to come during the ceasefire ceasefire from groups, not just Hamas, but Islamic Jihad. Second of all, Hamas ended the ceasefire, and before Israel went into Gaza last week, they fired hundreds of missiles back into Israel. You know, you know, the Israeli people have suffered for the last five to eight years with thousands of missiles being in, fired in onto the last, their towns. In the last eight 500 years, rockets only, from Hamas only over the last 16, week as well. Only 16 Israelis were killed in... Only in 16? Eight, 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 it's, of course, it is a sad uh, when, a, every, when a, one person is killed. Mm. But we have here uh, proportions. 16 uh, Israelis are killed in the eight years. We have 4,000 people, Palestinians, are killed on the, on the, on the Gaza Strip by the Israeli missiles and by Israeli assassination uh, squads. Uh, I just These wonder, I mean, you're, Robert, you're from the, you are from the conservative friends of Israel. I'm putting this to you, Peter Hitchens. I mean, this is a difficult time for friends of Israel, capital F and small f, isn't it? It's a very difficult time. Uh, partly, because, I think, because of the very second-rate nature of the political leadership in Israel at the moment. The problem with this action, apart from the very large numbers of innocent people who are getting killed in it, is that it isn't actually likely to achieve the aim set out for it. If I thought that Israel actually had a serious plan for stopping the rocket attacks on Sterot and other Israeli towns, mm -hmm. then I'd find a lot more sympathy in my heart for the action. What this is about, I'm afraid, is, is sordid electoral politics in Israel and the desire of, of various politicians <laughs> to, get them, to get themselves spurious reputations as hardliners. Six months from now, there will still be rockets being fired from Gaza into Israel, D uh, despite this operation. Once this is all over, it, it, it will continue to happen. If it, if, it were, if it were a serious operation to stop this, if such a thing could be contemplated, there'd be more to be said for it. But it's disproportionate, mm. not because of the level of arms involved, but because it simply doesn't have anything to do with its alleged aim. Well, okay, that's the real on, problem on that, Israel, Doug, Israel has. Douglas, I think, I think I could you Andrew, Andrew earlier, and I apologise for that. You, know, you, you, you have the, stat, <coughs> the, the stature of a tennis player, clearly. <laughs> but um, how can this do anything but 
strengthen the Hamas position, not only in, in the region, but across the whole Arab world. They've all of a sudden, look at the march yesterday with thousands of people there. Well, with Hamas, you know, I think it was 12,000 people, Hamas posters, you know, people like Alexei Sayle and Annie Lennox marching alongside people with Hamas posters. And all of a sudden, they're, they're sort of heroic freedom fighters. Really? They've been strengthening. You think Hamas or Annie Lennox become heroic freedom fighters? Or Alexei Sayle needs to tell you what's right and wrong no, in the your world? Problem, your uh, problem, your the, problem uh, is this. If I, if I may interject just a moment, your problem is this, that the very, very foolish and unbalanced ideas, a gentleman over there uh, enunciated one of them just now, that Israel in this conflict is Goliath and the Arabs are David, when Israel in fact has about, what, 2% of the, of the land mass of the Middle East and, and about the same population. This idea that Israel is the aggressive bully is created in the public mind. This war is not going to be won by rockets. It's not going to be won by tanks. It's being won or lost on the television screens of the world, if Israel loses the support of the peoples of Europe and North America, which is in grave danger of doing, does, then Israel will lose the war. Does, Douglas, 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 Douglas Murray. When, uh, when, Israel is, when Israel risks, like in 2006, having a million of its civilians having to live under uh, threat of rocket fire, this is something which should be beyond its concern about uh, what European governments think or don't think. You mentioned earlier about the, the, the huge number of civilian casualties. I can't think of another situation in war in which uh, a, f a fifth of casualties are civilian and in which uh, the Hamas have suffered up till now uh, perhaps as many as 400 uh, casualties. 400 uh, terrorists being killed seems to me to be good work. Children it's good work for the future of children Israel. It's good work for the future of the region. Upwards of 75 children have been killed. You can't call I'm them saying terrorists. If, if, uh, that if, no, I didn't call them terrorists. I said they were innocent civilians. So, but but, the, but, the, but the four the times that number of people being killed, the targeted people being killed, are terrorists, and they have been killed. And that is that can only be good for the region. Can it can only be good for Israeli security. And if, and if, if the Arab world really cares about the Palestinian peoples, why doesn't it do something for them practical instead of whining about this tiny sliver of land which Israel occupies? Why don't don't they realise that if there's going to be peace in the region, it relies on there being a Palestinian solution, and there relies on there being an Israeli solution? That can happen. But the first thing that has to happen is that the Arab governments and the Palestinians realize that Israel isn't going anywhere. If they, had, if they made that realization, why would they be firing rockets into Israel proper? Mark this isn't disputed territory. They're firing rockets into Israel. Fire, Why are they doing that? Fire, I know we have to look at the we have to look at the you know root causes of this uh, recent conflict. It didn't start uh, on the 27th of uh, of, of uh, December when the rockets started uh, flying and the and the eruption of this recent conflict. Uh, we we have uh, a six months of of siege and blockade over Gaza. People are starving in Gaza. Starvation by Israel, blockading uh, Israel supplies of food, of medical of food. medical aids uh, and and everything to Gaza. They there is a 41 year, uh, years of occupation. Palestinians are not allowed uh, to, to have their, their, their freedom. Israel withdrew from the, from the Gaza, uh, uh, from the settlements, but it continues its occupation of the Gaza Strip okay. by... by <laughs> Uh, Esther, let me bring Esther in. I mean, I just wonder, you know, as a Jewish woman, obviously you have this emotional attachment to Israel, I'm sure. How do you feel at the moment about all this? If I were God, I would ban religion. Yeah. God's given us how many thousand years of trying to make the world work religiously, Rabbi? And we have failed. You are a Semite. I am a Semite. Why can't we live together? We are, in the Middle East, neighbours. Actually, my emotional loyalty is to the country I was born in, which is Britain. So what I feel about this is, if I were God right now, I would say, Hamas, God's not on your side. Jews, you're not chosen people. I chose humanity, and you have failed me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to melt the ice caps. I'm going to cause the waters to rise, and I'm going to see whether that brings you together. Is that why it's happening? And, <laughs> and oh yes, overpopulation, all this stuff going but is on. This, okay, well, not, is, is this okay? Is this about religion? This is not about religion. This is about a free democratic nation fighting Islamist terrorist regime. Hold on, Islamist? Yes. 
All right, and, and Israel is a Jewish state, is it not? And it's a democratic Jewish state. Yes, and there are all kinds of other differences, but the most important thing they have in common is they're all human beings and they need each other. Israel has so much to offer beside bombs. It has expertise, it has skills. If it exported its doctors, its irrigation experts, its has scientists... To defend its, Israel has to defend itself when it How is being you attacked defend like yourself? any nation. You like defend yourself nation. politically. Politically. So, do, you know, do you know, as a liberal, uh, th uh, take some pleasure from the fact that Look, uh, an notes. Islamist, a hardline conservative Islamist organization, we've heard what they're like, Hamas, we know what they're like, we know what their policies are, we know their attitudes to gays, we, we know their attitudes to women. Do you not take some pleasure in the fact that their command and control structure is being destroyed? No, no, look, I can't take anybody who could take any pleasure from any of this is completely sick in the head. I mean, the point is, what I'm hearing here <laughs> is a lot of people arguing tit for tat about who's in the wrong and who's in the right and that's fine at an individual level a lot of people are very angry mm. a lot of people do feel very vengeful but at a state level you have to look strategically and this isn't going to work strategically mm. and you know you do have a moral responsibility at a state level to behave in a reasonable not vengeful but strategic way I just asked what anyone in Britain would do if we had 6,000 missiles raining down on us and we had a sixth of our population living in bunkers. Okay. We wouldn't tolerate it and nor should Israel. What would you tolerate that if we, if we, we had these rockets raining down on us in this country? What would we expect our government to do? Well, the rockets have been raining down on Occupy Gaza and they've been raining down on the West Bank. That's where the rockets have been raining down. It's an occupied country. The ma your, man, your man says that they're fighting an Islamic terrorist regime. I was in Nablus in 2002, and I saw the flattened police headquarters where they'd tried to fight the Israeli invasion with guns, and they'd brought in F-16 bombers that killed hundreds, hundreds of Fatah, not Islamic terrorists, Fatah, Soldiers and not soldiers. And they're of course police, the enemies police, of uh, Hamas police, at the moment and the in police. internal struggle. Now the Israelis. But it's all about the occupation and keeping the occupation of those lands. And when a few rockets, and I say a few rockets, come out, and well, during, thousands actually, thousands and, and, of rockets. And during the six-month ceasefire, none other than when the Israelis went in and killed. 22 Palestinians were killed in Gaza during the occupation. Uh, okay. 230 died from lack okay. of medical um, equipment. What, what, what's your view? Very quickly. Um, very quickly. Um, Hamas seems to be rather cynical in that they're placing their rockets in the hospital courtyards in the middle of populated civilian areas. Mm. And so, so when Israel is bombing them, um, of course they're going to cause civilian casualties because they're targeting the, the, the rockets. Launch. How can Hamas go on about... Uh, complain about civilians being targeted when they have been targeting civilians for so long and also when they are clearly holed up in civilian areas they, they that rocket hit a school in Bathsheba in Israel the other well, day we have to take in mind to take in mind that Hamas is a democratically elected uh, party and they are the government in uh, in in uh, in, uh, in Palestine and targeting uh, you know, Hamas is basically targeting the whole Palestinian people. What it, Israel has been doing recently well, is um, destroying the infrastructure of the Palestinian people and not Hamas. The targets that Israel have bombed in, in recent days in Gaza, the majority of these targets are ministries of education, ministries of health, uh, the clinics, the hospitals, uh, the uh, mosques. Uh, and including uh, United Nations uh, but of course, schools. But of course, P Peter Hitchens, you are so right, it's how it looks to the rest of the world, isn't it? Well, it, it, it is, and this, as I say, this is, this is the, the point that, where Israel is losing. And Mr Murray, I think it is, was talking about the, uh, how would a British government respond. Well, Britain was under terrorist attack for many years by the Irish Republican Army, to whom we've now surrendered as it happens, in the most shameful groveling I've ever well, seen. Okay, but put, while, put, that was, put that to one no, side that was While that was going on, we did not actually send our Air Force to bomb Dublin. And I don't think that, that, that it would have been considered a particularly sensible response. Effective, effect, effective response or, or, is one thing. Ineff ineffective, politically blundering, or, or, or flailing Douglas Murray, doesn't or Douglas work. During the Troubles, of course, perhaps a better analogy would have been flattening or bombing the Catholic parts of Derry. We never did that, did we? No, but we sent in troops. We had, no, we had uh, areas where we had f famous uh, mistakes by the British Army during the Northern Ireland Troubles. This is, however, not at all similar to the 
the situation in Northern Ireland, and, and the president just doesn't work. Uh, the uh, IRA uh, were not uh, uh, ele elect an elected uh, uh, organisation, as Hamas claimed to be at the moment. They had massive they didn't, support. They didn't fire uh, rockets into ma mainland Britain with it's the continuity that, that, uh, that the Hamas d did. Uh, the Hamas have uh, effectively ministries uh, in the Gaza. They have arms dumps in the Gaza. They, if we had been able to identify similar arms dumps uh, in, in the IRA's times, if the IRA had had, uh, had the munitions that the Hamas do now, we would have done everything and anything similar people. to what Israel has they done. Killed more people. They, killed, one, one second, they, but they killed more people with massive atrocities on the British mainland than uh, Hamas no, have managed have with no. rockets over ha ha ten years. Hamas have killed hundreds of people through suicide bombings and sending in suicide bombs. This is why the security fence has been needed. Well, the, the Hamas IRA, is the IRA and, and, and people. And if I, add, if I just may, may add, there is also just a fundamental misunderstanding about making the IRA comparison, which is the IRA never uh, had as its, uh, as, its, uh, uh, as its charter obligations the annihilation of the British state. That is what Hamas is in its charter, uh, dedicated to the annihilation of Israel, not the negotiation, not, not an issue over particular borders, but the annihilation of Israel. That's why it's well, sending rockets into Maine. Zoe Williams. Zoe Williams. Surely that is why Israel's priority then should be separating the Palestinian people from Hamas and not uniting them all under this indiscriminate I'm not bombing. Sure uniting them all. Mr. Well, Hamas is not uniting with. Uh, I mean, with uh, well, we've got an aid worker here. You were in uh, Gaza quite recently, weren't you? I was there last January. What's yeah. the? Well, I just wonder what the opinion was then about Hamas uh, in, in Gaza and what it would be now. Um, to be honest, the work we do at Islamic Relief, um, the work people we work with, they're less concerned now and then about the politics and the political posturing that goes on, and w which leaves always inevitably, which we see it everywhere in Darfur, we work, work in Darfur, Afghanistan, everywhere, you know, all this political posturing, there's people who suffer are the civilians, mm -hmm. the poor people who have no say, who have no way of kind of making any uh, uh, representation to anybody about what they would like or what they want. They're the ones who are suffering. They're the ones who are, um, who, who are victims to all of this. And this inhumane kind of posturing from all sides is, is something which is quite, quite sad uh, to see. And I was just on the phone to one of our colleagues. Colleagues mm. just last night, and he said, mm. "Look, I'm, I'm in the. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that Israelis can hide in bunkers. Uh, sadly for the Gazans, there are no such bunkers to hide in." Um, he said, "I'm in the cellar of our house, um, and, and we can hear them outside now." He says, "How are you? We're, we're all terrified, and we don't know if we're going to see the, mo the morning sun rise." So it's it's really quite a terrible situation for the Palestinians. The humanitarian situation was dire before this. Mm. Before this, you know, the, before this uh, recent campaign. Many of the most uh, respected NGOs were coming out saying, look, this is, this is not tenable. You cannot continue as you are. 75% of people in Gaza continue to rely on handouts, food handouts. You know, this is not a situation but which as continues. as Gordon Brown said, uh, you know, they must, well, we'll get you in here. Gordon Brown said on the Andrew Marr program a little bit earlier on, Israel must have security. Mm. Um, well, on, on that subject, I think, uh, we, we can spend a lot of time talking about who's justified and who's not, but I don't think it's that type of situation. It's a long-term problem, and this is a short-term solution, because violence only escalates violence. And I think... Um, it is strange um, we've, wait, we've had this debate, but not once we have we called it what it is. We talked about Islamism, we talked about the Hamas, but we don't talk about Zionism. I mean, what is Zionism? Do we people know Zionism is a political ideology? It's not the same as Judaism. We need to separate the two. We also need to understand that to be anti-Israeli is not to be anti-Semitic. The two are totally, vastly different. They're not linked at whatsoever. We also need to see the parallel between what, ha what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto and what's happening in Gaza today. I mean, that is the parallel we need to see. We need to understand... Okay, one, 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 last one on that. I just saw, I saw people with, with placards at one of the demonstrations the other day saying, Stop the Holocaust. How do you feel? I when you see posters like that, and when you hear, last word here on this, I think but when you hear comparisons like utterly that. utterly despicable. There is a bottom line here, and that is plain and simple. If Gaza stopped firing rockets, Israel would pull out of Gaza. So what the That's what it comes down to. That is the what bottom is the line. Difference? The what is the difference? You're missing the point. If no, you're missing Gaza, the point. If Hamas stops firing its rockets into Israel, Israel would not be there in the first instance. Israel would leave there. So how and therefore, how can Israel, Israel get hold of 82% of the land? Uh, sorry. How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? How can Israel get hold of 82% of the land? To, to equate the deliberate, the deliberate extermination of European Jewry 
by Nazi Germany with anything that Israel has done. You know it's wrong. I it's false parallel. propaganda, I and you should be ashamed of it. Thank it's you all very much. Thank you very much. I thought we've got time for on that one, unfortunately. But listen, you can have your say. And I'm sure you've got something to say about it. Just log on to bbc.co.uk forward slash the big questions. Follow the links to the message board. We're also asking on this morning's programme, is it right to experiment on animals? And can you commit adultery online? So why not send us your thoughts on those topics too? Well, in recent weeks, people have been taking to the streets here in Oxford to protest against the opening of a new biomedical research centre. Its scientists will be seeking cures for cancer, heart disease, strokes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, HIV, muscular dystrophy and motor neuron disease. Well, you can't argue with that. But there is a big argument about their laboratory methods, especially the use of fish, frogs, mice, ferret and indeed monkeys. Is it right to experiment on animals? Two animal rights protesters here, uh, Amanda and Emma. Good morning to you. Good morning. What are they doing to these monkeys? They're doing quite horrific things to them. They're training them to do certain tasks by depriving them of food and water. They're starving them into submission and the reward is to have the tops of their heads sliced off and electrodes forced into their brains. It's just horrendous what's happening to these animals. What about the other animals there, the mice? I mean, do you, do you care as much for the mice as you do for the monkeys? Absolutely, and, absolutely. They're just mice and rodents and yeah, fish, yeah. people will say, for goodness sake. So, you know, some people will draw a line and think, I find the, the idea of macaque monkeys being experimented on in that way extremely disturbing, but, but, but mice? Yes, um, a, a mouse's life is just as important as a monkey's life and just as important as a person's life. I mean, they so, are doing I mean, our things... last debate, do you equate it with the, the, the horrors that we've been hearing about there in wars? I mean, do you think it's as... You, you, I know you feel passionately about this, but do you think it's as relevant and as important? Suffering Absolutely. is suffering. Yeah. I mean, they are doing things to animals in laboratories that would be considered torture if it was done to people. Mm -hmm. And yet we know animals feel pain. We know that they suffer both physically and psychologically. Um, and the reason um, that experimenters give for why we should be allowed to do this is because they say animals are worth less than people. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the, the same kind of ridiculous claim that the Nazis made when they experimented on those they'd imprisoned inside concentration camps. They said it's because they were worth less than they were. And it's the same kind of claim that white people made when they enslaved black people. They said it was okay because they're worth less than we, um, so than we are. Uh, but I'm a, sorry, that, that is not a reason. No. That is an excuse for exploitation We're just getting context abuse. from you, but what, if somebody were to say, were to say to a relative of yours, a love... A, 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 a loved one, look, Herceptin will save your life, or you indeed, and Herceptin was, what well, incontrovertibly, it was tested on animals. Would you accept that drug? Would you be happy about your nearest and dearest having that drug, Emma? Yes or no? Um, to save their life? I mean, the, the problem is that all drugs have been tested on animals, and I don't have a choice. You know, if, right. if there was a choice between... Um, drug that had or hadn't. You just want to stop the testing? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, but it is not right to expect a sentient being that can suffer. And it's torture, to that's the word you it use. It is torture, It's torture, absolutely. Dr. Simon Festing, it's torture. Well, it, <coughs> medical research is about compassion for people and, and, of course, animals, because they benefit from medical research, animal research as well. All the veterinary medicines were developed in animals. Um, the point is that... Uh, Use of animals is a small but vital part of medical research to develop new cures and treatments. Um, is it vital? I, yes, it is vital. It's a small but nonetheless vital because you cannot do it in the alternatives. You can't study a beating heart in a test tube. Let's just talk about well, we the hear example. What they're doing to those monkeys, yes. for example. So let's talk about the, that. Yes, let's talk about that. The surgeon at Oxford University operates on 200 patients each year for Parkinson's disease. Mm. He slices off the top of their heads and he inserts electrodes into their brains, exactly as he does to the two monkeys that he uses every year for research. It's the same operation, but he applies the results of that research directly to improve the operation he does in his patients. It's a life-saving operation for Parkinson's disease. These monkeys are isolated 
That's in not cages. True. Yes, yes, no, they are. No, no, they're they're housed together in groups. They're extremely <laughs> well looked after, oh. and they are given. You w you would not wish to mistreat them because you wouldn't get re good results from your surgery. Mm. Oh. It's the same operation that he does in the patients that he does on the monkeys. So the patient but understands what's going to happen. Exactly. Them, this, Whereas yeah, the animal, it just think, doesn't doing know what it, why you're doing that. You're just being randomly cruel to it. And animals, I think, animal animals rights. are souls. Uh, and no, you know, maybe we benefit. Maybe we benefit from that benefit? sort of research, yeah. right? Right. You might have a good argument for that. But the fact that higher animals, especially monkeys and dogs and cats, do have some sort of soul, some sort of consciousness there, and do suffer when you sort of inflict these sort of treatments. My cats on them are they don't cousins, understand. aren't they? Yes, that's that, right. And that that's is exactly immoral. Why that they are used? As you <coughs> say, I mean. We're, Using this kind of surgery on monkeys, this is less than one in 10,000 of animal research projects. It's a tiny, tiny part, but it is nonetheless very important. Well, is it important, Andrew Manash? I mean, if it wasn't important, they wouldn't be doing it. I'm sure they don't enjoy doing it. Okay, of course well, not. Animal experimentation is bad science. Uh, the jury is still out on whether deep brain stimulation in people is helping, is causing more good than harm, or vice versa. Um, the, the research that... Uh, it's completely untrue. There is 50 miles away yeah. from here there are researchers doing non-invasive scanning on human volunteers and they are getting equivalent, equivalent data. They don't have to do these experiments on monkeys. Andre, that is completely untrue. The world's leading medical experts, and this has just been in a published paper in Nature, have said that this um, fMRI scanning that you're talking about does not give the same results and that you cannot replicate the studies that you do in animals with scanning. It's a completely different technique that just measures the blood flow in the brain. Now, of course, we nobody would wish to use alternatives if it could be avoided. Nobody wants to use animals. I mean, of course we recognise all the ethical concerns. We would much but isn't there a com commercial no. imperative too? Not at all, no. Most, most research, no. Animal use is very expensive and it's very time consuming. We would, so we are investing hundreds of millions of pounds in the alternative, in scanning, in microdosing, uh, in these advanced mechanisms of cell cultures, computer simulations. Now we've got it to the stage where animal research is only a small part of medical research. But Most still a vital one, as you said earlier. OK, let's take yeah. it to the panel. I mean, Esther Ranson, do you fi not find this repulsive? No, absolutely I do not find this at all repulsive. Thank heavens that the Americans uh, were able to look at the results of thalidomide use on pregnant rabbits saw that it produced terrible deformities in baby rabbits and saved the American public from what we went through in this country. I'm listening to... Excuse me, I am listening to the logical, carefully thought through argument by a man who does not appear to me to be a psychopath or a sadist and I don't but you believe, never know and okay. I don't believe that scientists who work with animals don't care about them don't suffer with them and don't wish to find other methods but I'm hearing in you a very powerful emotional argument and I just wonder whether you've actually been to research laboratories walked with scientists like that doctor heard about the work that they're doing and seen the precautions they take well, except in polio vaccine insulin I mean they've all been tested on animals haven't they of course they've all been tested on animals but at the same time there was clinical research going on at the same time uh, if you want to take polio for, for as, an, as an example the the researchers who discovered the um, cell culture to produce polio vaccine uh, Enders, Robbins and Weller uh, they received the Nobel, Peace, the Nobel Prize in 1954 they couldn't get it right in monkeys they tried in desperation human cell culture and it worked we have today the possibility so to you're saying it's been bad science vaccines. for a long time it's been an why, inexact why science this obsession why this obsession even today to grow human vaccines in monkey cells why still today this obsession? Peter Hitchens, do you worry about a mouse in, in, in this context? Uh, to, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm hopeless about this. I use humane mouse traps, and <laughs> I, 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 I do. And I think, that, I, I think that, that most of us who think about animals and who have begun to have a slightly less wonderful impression of how valuable we are as life goes on do think that there is a disproportion sometimes in our willingness to practice things on animals and to test things on animals for the, for the, so that we can be cured of diseases which but in many vital. cases we brought on ourselves. We're here. I, don't, that, that, I think that the animal processors perform a very valuable function in, in making sure that we don't go too far. 
But I think that a total ban would be absurd because I think the, 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 the scientists who argue for experimentation also have a serious case. But I think they'd accept that they're more restrained now than they would have been 20 or 30 years ago precisely because the protesters have touched their consciences. I think that's a good thing. We've always recognised the ethical debate, and we know that people have concerns. I'm more than happy to get you into a research centre and explain to you... And we wire him strictest up. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a go if you want. Yes. No, thanks. But, but, do you know, it's easier to get permission to do research on humans than it is on animals. We have the most comprehensive laws anywhere in the world, in the UK. You have to get three government licences. You have to prove there's no alternative. You have to demonstrate that you're looking after the animals as well Would as you Would you volunteer to be researched on is, in, in the stead of... Some Ethical of these animals framework. to save them. I, I mean, if, if I would, um, if I had a disease, I would certainly be. be have you ever been to... into a laboratory with well, perhaps someone? We do not let people into, no. into these Would you places? let those ladies in to yes, have a look at the way yes, you work? We, we will not let anyone in who we think will do criminal activity. You must behave yourselves when you're there. We will let in. I can get in these, most of these people without any trouble, but they refuse to come in. We've invited them and they come to the front door and then they say, no, we do don't want to see you. We've never been invited yeah. inside. Do you have, do you have cat, a cat, don't you? or no, dog, dogs, no, yeah? Dog, yeah? And you worm your dog. Yeah. So inevitably the worms are killed. That's for the health of your dog. Mm -hmm. Is there not a, a, a bigger story here that animals are dying for the health of human beings? And it's exactly the same, isn't it? Exactly the same relationship between, between your dog and those worms. No, not at all, because we're, 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 talking, we're talking about animals who are being tortured. Mm -hmm. Well, those worms um, aren't having a great time, and, right? Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're talking but about animals who are being them. treated as mere you're property. Disgusting. You're, no disgusting. More right you're just, a piece you're of just disgusting. You're just disregarding the life. I'm, I don't mean. I'm, I'm really not trying to be facetious because some people believe in the sanctity of all life, and you're just disregarding the, the lives of those worms. <laughs> You're just, you're exterminating those worms. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it has to be done for, for, for the good of the animals. It has to be done for the good no, of the animals. Because we're talking, uh, with animal experimentation, we're, we're talking about causing immense animal suffering. Oh, we're we're talking about Amanda, millions and millions of animals. We've debated this so many times, uh, Amanda. Uh, and all she ever does is she says, oh, floors. it's talk. Who goes Don't into work? Don't tell me you're all friends. Who goes into <laughs> work? Yeah. Who goes into work every day to torture fish? I mean, it's just nonsense. You, you look at no, absolutely. Look, I went to a research, no, to went to a research lab the other day they where they were testing to see why there are no fish coming back, why the eels are dying out. They were using very low doses of pollutants to test uh, that were just affecting whether the reproductive rates on the fish. This is about conservation. This is about protecting wildlife you've and You've animals. cleaned your act up, right, to some extent, and you've done the PR. Well, I've had to get the, the, the laws no, changed. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. Because you of the, the people like them, you've no, had to sort of No, because you, you have up, a Everybody knows how cruel it was in the past. It's, you, it's on yes, film, it's on because record. Because we want to look after the animals this thing goes well on and then you see it. Let me tell you, what does this lady want? Because it's a big issue, of course, here in Oxford because of the new laboratory. What do you think? Well, I think it's a highly emotional and highly controversial topic. And I think for the first time, I find myself sitting on the fence. Uh, I believe in the sanctity of all life. Yes. And wouldn't want to see wanton cruelty or ill treatment mm. of animals in captivity. But at the same time, I go along with the idea that if there are carefully controlled, humane and ethical and necessary experiments that work towards the creation of, of drugs or improvement in drugs for healing people with life-threatening diseases. With proper diseases, controls. Then proper controls, I yeah. would go along with it. Yes, and with the red, and the red jacket, yeah. Well, it's been really unfortunate with this issue for so long that it's become so polarised that, you know, people tend to... It's shut down a lot of debate how extreme a lot of the animal rights movement has been, particularly in Oxford. I mean, if you live here, you joke that we're all friends. Everybody knows everybody in Oxford. It's, it's, Clearly. It's a very small place. <laughs> <laughs> and that there is this real concern about being seen with the animal rights movements because it's become often a small minority has been so extreme and animal testers have been seen as these evil, awful people. And I, it, it shuts down the debate and it, it really concerns mm. me. And I, I would hate, I mean, I hate the thought of animal testing, I do, I hate it. I understand, I, I have a nursing background, I understand that at the moment it's necessary. But I think public opinion is moving further and further away from animal testing and I would like oh. to see more resources put that in that way and I know my generation would probably be out there waving the placards en masse if it wasn't for the fact that it was seen as such an extreme Even issue. Even fish? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I think that's the direction of travel, and I think there needs to be more resources put in, into but this area to find to, alternatives, rather than attacking the people yeah. doing the testing. Zoe, there uh, needs to be that understanding. We need an alternative. Zoe, I wonder, is it a credible position to be against animal testing yet to eat meat? Well, yet yeah, no, that's not credible at all. But I think, I think as a society, we've got to accept that we do value an animal's life worth as, as less than a human's. I think that just is, you have to take that as given, otherwise we wouldn't eat meat. Um, so, you know. Do you not admire the passion of I do admire animal? it very much, and I think history might yet prove us wrong. You know, in 100 years' time, we might look at the way we've treated animals like as slavery. a kind of incredible, like slavery, as an mm. incredible kind of violation. But I think in the meantime, while we do mm. kind of put ourselves at a, at a premium, then we've just got to put the accent on avoiding cruelty, and I think you can do that. You know, I don't think I don't think it's impossible. You have to do your these doubts, um, Amanda. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, we know that the animals suffer inside the laboratories. You know, you, you can't well, no, have... I mean, they're, they're, this is done with pain relief, is it, is it not? A, a, a Two-thirds of the experiments carried out in this country are done without any anesthetic at all. That That's because it's so mild that to give an anesthetic would be worse than the actual research itself. Talking about studies here, for example, change in diet, taking blood samples. There's one where you test for a medicine to see if it's drowsy and you just warm up the plate underneath a rat's tail and it flicks its tail up. Now, to get, why would you give an anaesthetic for that? These animals are well looked after. But they could have saved, you want to get good and results. Richard here, and they can I, I, save lives. They saved your life, you believe, because you're, you're, in, you're in remission at the moment from cancer. That's right. And looking extremely well. Thank you. Uh, so and thank you for taking the time to come on the programme this morning. And you've taken drugs which were surely, clearly, tested on animals. Yes, I, and I, I have. I mean, uh, for me, you see, I'm a, com a consumer, if you like, of everything that's being talked about yes. here uh, this morning. And when you are diagnosed with cancer, and when you're told that this cancer is aggressive and fast-acting, and you're offered a course of treatment, which if you were in a position to actually think clearly enough about, to think about its history, its, its research history, mm. um, it, it just simply does not occur to you to ask about the provenance of the medicine. The point is, you have a responsibility to yourself as an ill person to seek any form of treatment that can get you better. You have a responsibility to your family. And I think the last thing on one's mind, and I'm sure this I speak for people who are not just cancer patients, but for but people in, with all sorts of conditions, you have <coughs> the last thing on your mind is to wonder about the ethical production of the medicine that you're given. You just want one to get well. Wants to get well. Exactly. You have had the last word on this, and we wish you well. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well. If you agree with what's been said, you can log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions, put your views on our message board. Please do that. Take the trouble if you've got the time. We, and also let us know what you think about our last debate. Can you commit adultery online? And also you can apply to be in our audience at future shows. We'll be in Leicester next week, Canterbury on January the 18th, and in my own hometown, Edinburgh, on the 25th. So, does your uh, nearest and dearest spend a lot of time surfing the World Wide Web, as it used to be called? Well, beware. Uh, they may be leading another existence in virtual reality where they are footloose, fancy-free, and game for, well, pretty much anything. Can you commit adultery online? Now, there's, there's lots of facets to this. There's sort of online dating and email romances, but there's also Second Life, which is, which is this virtual world that the two of you partake in. Yes. You haven't met each other until today, have you? No, no, not and at all. And you haven't met each other that. online? No. <laughs> have no. you had an affair with each other online? No, not, not my time. Not Just, che no, okay. <laughs> Just checking. It's possible, but tell us, in a sentence, if you could, Mog, isn't yeah. it? Uh, tell us in a sentence, what is Second Life? Well, technically, it's, a, it's a, what's called a virtual chat room. So it's, a, it's another world, it's like another dimension with almost a million and a half users who enter into a virtual reality world. Of a different and, persona. You have an avatar, well, either it looks like, in my case it looks like me. In this his is case. your avatar, now we're going to have a look at your avatar. It's, 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 it's sort image, of yeah. looks slightly like me, whereas some people use it as a way of having a mask or a persona, uh, because that maybe they, they want to hide. You've still trimmed yourself down on there, though, I know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so have a look at your, so have a look, your two avatars, because you're yeah. a man and a woman. Yeah. <laughs> I do have two, I do have two, yeah. I used to be a drag queen, it's a bit of fun, why not? 
So, so there you go. Uncanny, isn't it? Absolutely uncanny. That's, that's you. Can Can I just say, what's, what's the name of that one? Use, that's Ambrosius. Right, and I'm, I'm Mog, I'm Mog Morgwain in Second Life. So you're quite close but, to... But a lot of the use, right, there's the gaming use. You should say that it, a great deal of Second Life is, is an educational tool. Because real people interact in this virtual reality world, they, it's used for language teaching. All the major universities well, around we the world that, have well, a, a presence When we were there. school boys and we used to get Playboy, which I get it for the articles. You know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's exactly the same <laughs> argument, isn't the thing it? Is like, what's your woman called, by the way? Uh, <laughs> bring it on. Um, but, uh, by the way, I am gay, so if she's just a bit of fun. Um, oh, that's fun. What's her name? Bring it on, Bashley. Oh, it is bring it on. I yeah. thought you were saying bring it on. Bring it on, bring it on, Bashley. Have, bring it on, yeah, there have you go. Have you had, with, with the male one, have you had sex online in the past? Um, I, I, I did right at the beginning. I just thought, found it quite amusing, to be honest. I mean, in real life, you don't walk into a shop and buy your own penis, really, to be frank, do you? Uh, let's be honest. So, you know... And, and Sorry, also, but for those of a sensitivity also, watching uh, uh, this time on a Sunday morning, yes. myself included... <laughs> <laughs> for that. We are but, talking about cheese. But you have, to, you, have to, you have to buy the paraphernalia with which to, to, yes, to which have sex. To Perform. Or yes. well, you can go to certain places, dungeons and sex clubs that kind of exist. Because all, all human life is, is in second life. Oh, okay. It is a sort of reflection of the real world. So if you wanted sex, you wouldn't have to buy anything. You go to a particular club uh, and you would find people willing to participate in that sort of thing. Is it unfaithful, Ian? I don't believe it is unfaithful because you're sat there in front of your computer. So, in, in effect, how are you cheating? It's like saying if you watch porn, you're, then you're engaging cheating. with somebody else's sexuality, whether it be bring it on or whatever. Yeah, but well, it's a, let's be honest, right? I, I mean, it's a lot more messy and a lot more awkward in real life. You know, but you're still it's engaging like your like thoughts. Is it? Can it? Can it be not I adulterous, think, but maybe it could be infidelity? I think it's real enough. I think it's yeah. it's not the same as as a physical contact but it's real enough that real emotions very strong emotions get involved in this mm. and it can leak out into real life as, as you probably know from some of the things in the paper it can be it can cause relationship breakdowns and it also has an effect yeah. emotional effect on the people in second life I think you were saying earlier when we were talking about that if you get you would if you get rejected by another avatar in second life now intellectually you might think that's not going to have any impact on you but it saves you enough it's a crushing <laughs> Once on there, and I did have the. I did. I was a bit. You know, so this is for Monica. You're an expert on this. This is real stuff for people, isn't it? Uh, you know, and and if you are engaging with somebody else, if you are living this this avatar life, this second life as somebody you always wanted to be, the sort of figure, fantastically good looking and well built, and you're having an, some sort of an affair with with another avatar, it, it, there's an there's an element of disloyalty there, isn't there? there? There is. I guess when you look at internet infidelity, though, you need to look at the different spaces on online as well. Yeah. So my research has looked at people that get into chat rooms and develop relationships there and have cyber sex and, and the like in different spaces online. And in those spaces you're talking to someone um, who's not necessarily pretending to be a different persona. Um, and why people will see it as infidelity is if you fall in love with someone online and that's seen almost as awful as falling in love with someone else online that's not your partner. You're spending time self-disclosing intimate details about yourself that may be reserved for your romantic relationship. It's a guilty mind. Well, when it's kept a secret, then that's guilt as well. It's also the idea of desiring someone else too, wanting to have um, cyber sex, even if it's not real sexual penetration, really wanting to. I'm going to. I'm going. Let's go to our avatars. I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm going to be Peter Hitchens, I think. <laughs> but what do you think about the, what do you think about the second life business and people doing this? And can it lead? to a, a form of adultery, do you think? Uh, how, how can I comment on this? The wickedest thing I ever do on the internet is edit my own Wikipedia entry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there does seem to be something terribly sad about it to me. It is deeply, deeply sad. I got very bored of it after a while. I think. Could you say the same about television? A time television you is could, virtual reality. You could. I, the, the, with, in so many parts of people's lives, they, they have no real life. There is no neighborhood. There is no family. There is no friendship anymore. There's electronic substitutes for it. And this, this strange void into which the internet sucks you is a bit, as somebody once rather unkindly and unfairly said of New Zealand, uh, it's always worth remembering there is no there there. There's nothing there. <laughs> And, and you, you're, you're, just, you're, just, you're just going into a void. I get, come out of it while you can until, until, until your whole brain is vacuumed out. Into, into but can it space. be... Uh, is this a form of infidelity, Esther? When I was 14, I spent a week 
reading Gone with the Wind. Mm. And during that week, I was Scarlett O'Hara, strange okay. as it may seem. Right. And I was so... What do you mean? <laughs> Who is this man? Good heavens. Um, and I was profoundly in love with Rhett Butler. Now, why was that different from what you do? I think it was. And I'll tell you why. Because Margaret R Mitchell, who wrote Gone with the Wind, was an extraordinary woman. And she created a historical context and she described these people, complicated, difficult people, so that I learned about humanity while I was in love. I mean, people had this experience Did you have reading Jane about Eyre Red and, and Wuthering Heights. What concerns me about you two is what was happening to the rest of your life. <laughs> I've seen television... I don't spend that much time on it. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, when you are there, you can go to different worlds. You know, it, in real life, it would take you hours to take a plane to, I, I don't know, to deserts or whatever. On this, you've got all these different worlds, and, you know, in a second, although it's not real... Let me tell you, you can my... You just see it. I mean, uh, it's, it's just a bit of fun. I see it as a giant game. I see it as a big online game. I do not see how you can cheat But it can be very in involving. I mean, John, you're, you're a divorced lawyer. Can, I mean, what about, yeah. it's, it, can, can it lead to people thinking things and doing things I that they shouldn't say, be? <clears throat> First of all, one thing I would say is, it isn't adultery, because adultery has a very specific meaning in English law. Mm. And it is um, sexual intercourse between two people by consent, one of whom is married, but not, not necessarily to the other, at least one. So it isn't adultery, but it is certainly, in my view, infidelity. And I'm seeing more and more of this I would say, extraordinary enough, probably a quarter to a third of my cases have an internet input into them. Really? A very large proportion. And I think when people become unhappy, it is their first source. In the olden days, maybe it was uh, wife swapping. Uh, this technology now is available. It's available if you were dissatisfied Can with I your life. Can I ask about that? What do you mean, in the old days, it was wife swapping? <laughs> I, 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 I'll, no, I'll tell you. You remember. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> it, was a, it was a sort of um, infection in this country which lasted four or five years in the it? 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Not what, what's that pair of car keys <laughs> doing down there? What is all this? <laughs> if, 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 somebody, if you found somebody that you were romantically involved with on being... A, uh, being an avatar online, having uh, av having it away with an avatar, or whatever the expression would be, you you would you wouldn't say quite frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. To take a line from from your favourite book, you'd be furious, wouldn't you? No. Or would I contemplate would I contemplate a threesome? Oh for, well, well there, there, is, there is a rabbi shock it. I, uh, first of all, I, with respect, I would have thought you should enjoy that sort of role because then you can be God and then you can ban all sort of religion. But leaving that aside. I would say to He's you that... taken it personally. I didn't mean it. No, it's all right. It doesn't constitute it? adultery. I think actually it's a cheap escapism. It reflects a certain frustration in a person's life. Sure. It doesn't constitute adultery in the absolute sense, but it certainly is unfaithful. And in that regard, in say in the context of a marriage, when a husband or a wife has to escape into the computer to express themselves on that, in that sort of manner, You've got to ask what is wrong at the core of their very own relationship that they need to express it somewhere inside the world. But, but you would probably say the same thing about people watching pornography, wouldn't you? You'd probably disapprove Somebody of that. Somebody watching pornography on the internet is, again, looking for some sort of cheap escapism mm -hmm. where he's trying to compensate for something that is lacking within the context of his own relationship. There are some people that pretend yeah. that, that, you know, while they're are making love to their partner, that they're making love to somebody else. I mean, surely in some ways that's worse than having this online avatar that looks nothing like you. It's a fantasy version of you. Or, or, what, or, or what we around. all do now and again. When you see an attractive person, you think, I wonder. And, yeah. you know, we all do that, there don't we? Or it's just me. that have, have <laughs> a <laughs> list of people yeah, that they would... Well, I know. think that if for you, something your partner does in an online game mm. carries the same weight as a real affair in the real world, then you've got bigger problems than mm. infidelity. Mm. <laughs> Surely it's like what Eric Young said in Fear of Flying, that you, don't, you, you can't help yourself thinking about other people all the time, and surely it's just a harmless fantasy. And you've got this huge buffer of the fact you've never actually met the person face to face. You don't know them, you're not involved with all the nuances of their personality that you can only pick up through physical interaction. Surely it is really just the same as looking at somebody else and imagining what it would be like to be there. Monica, but that can be dangerous, the fact that I, I think, um, I mean, more can be said. But the, the, the important part is looking at the interaction and the emotions that are involved mm. in that. And so looking at 
do you really fall in love with this person? Do you want to continue seeing this person? So when we're looking at these different aspects of the internet, second life may not be perceived by as many people as a real act of infidelity. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because some people don't identify with their avatar. Some people see it as a game. And if it's in the context of a <coughs> game and they're not engaging in the, the same well, all, way... All, all the messaging in, that goes on there. It, and, exactly. Uh, so, and when we look at offline stuff too, we know that if you have a fantasy about someone that perhaps is a pop star or whatever, then your spouse is less likely to see that as upsetting or betrayal because you're probably not going to have that opportunity to having sex with them. And yet, but if it's their best having, friend... Having indecent <laughs> images of children on your computer is an offence, not just because you're abetting and aiding the people who are taking those pictures, but frankly because of the real concern that it goes from there to feed Absolutely. something very, very Ab grotesque and Absolutely. perverse. Absolutely. And yeah. if that works in that context, then it works in every other context as well. Do you think, uh, uh, Zoe, do you think it will work in this context too? Do you think this is a slippery think, slope? I don't know. I think the main problem with child porn is the, is the children who are photographed in there. It's not the people themselves. I mean, the, you know, you're talking well, about right a kind of... It, it's not right to call it porn. I know the, the people who are battling against this don't like it being called child porn because porn Porn is legitimate. This, these are abusive, okay, okay, okay. These are abusive I mean, images of children. What you're children. talking about is that you're talking about a kind of uh, levels mm. of victimhood. I don't think there's a. I don't think there's any level of victimhood in Second Life. But can it lead you on and on and sort of drag you into this fantasy world? I think world? it's very unfair to write off all escapism as an inherently bad thing. I think it's very unfair to privilege novels as immensely better than an uh, online community because some online communities are very complex and they you know people have very high level conversations with one another. I think it's very unfair. With one another, but they're not, are well, they? Yeah, 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 they are. Yeah, they are. Well, I mean, they I, relate I think to one you're another. not understanding that, that, that the avatars, that each avatar is a real person behind it. They may be in America, they may be in other parts of the world, they may be disabled, they may have all sorts of other things going on in their lives. But, but it's his real. was a laugh, wasn't no, it? No, no, yeah. but he is interacting. I mean, maybe uh, yeah, controversially. Is it's a very, sorry, it's a very male say, thing. Say, maybe saying the internet itself was bad, going back to something earlier, saying the internet itself is bad, I wouldn't have come out, had the, had the guts to come out as gay at six. 16, had it not been for the internet and that helped me out so it's a sign of our times it depends how you use it um, I didn't know there were other people like me you know how much how much stuff that goes on online I mean I, you know the thing is Douglas Murray this comes back to don't look so alarmed I'm not going to ask who your avatar is <laughs> but there was the, I'm, just, I'm just recently thinking of the case and this is right in your area of terrorism and counter-terrorism the recent case of the the lyrical terrorist, this is the woman who was writing, she worked at I think Heathrow and she was writing poems about beheading infidels and how wonderful that would all be. How, how far is that allowable because it's a, I mean it becomes a thought crime at, at this stage and that's a worrying development if you can't let people think. Well she appealed and I think and got off uh, in, in that particular case the lyrical terrorist. The thing is that the, the, the internet gives people the opportunity to kind of pursue uh, another life. Sometimes uh, as being said already that can lead people down extreme routes yes. and there are there are many many cases and my think tanks chronicled among others many cases of people who have gone into the internet as, as young people have, have come across radical groups Groups, radical mm. sentiments have, have absorbed that and have gone down a very bad uh, path because of that. The internet has incredible uh, scope for good, but it also has incredible scope for bad, and we have to be aware of that. Why people are doing second lifing? Is it because their lives are un enriching, unfulfilling? Is that the reason why they're doing that? Because if you have a rich life, a fulfilling life, there's no need to look for a second life. Why watch a DVD, though? Why, why read why a novel? Why, 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 I don't need to become why that. Why watch a DVD? Why go to the theatre? And why, why becoming that? You know, it's, it's all escapism. Why read a book? Because you need to escape from the real life sometimes and just etc. If you're sometimes spending, real life if you're spending unnatural amounts of time on there, then yes, seriously, do get a life. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But you may have everything in, in moderation. You, in moderation. you may have innocent moderation. second lives, but moderation. we've seen uh, with terrorism and other kind of things, maybe uh, disastrous second lives. What mm. about those things then? Mm. Well, yes, Monica. Yeah. There, are many Very quickly. there are many therapeutic benefits of developing relationships online. I don't think we should lose sight of that. Sure. And, and we have communities online. We have additional social support. People can meet other people with similar interests and okay. problems. It's an incredible world out there. And all the debates continue on our message board online. Uh, join us next week 